Well, welcome, John. It's, uh, it's great having you here with us, and uh, we'll be hearing from you very shortly in your distinguished lecture, but we take a little time out to say hello more informally right. uh, at our fireside uh, chat without, without the fire today. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so just a little bit maybe about your background and how you got interested in computer science, and where did that interest come from to start with? Uh, let's see. So I, yeah, I'm, I guess where the interest came from, I, in high school, I was, uh, I think I sort of wanted to be a math major. I mean, actually, I, from some early phase, I either wanted to be like a math major or a fiction writer or a lawyer, I think. But, you know, gradually this all sort of coalesced towards something more technical. And I also, uh, that was kind of the era when the Apple II Plus had just appeared. And so I, you know, I liked writing programs in the Apple II Plus. I liked writing games that my friends could play in the school library on floppy disks and things. But I somehow didn't imagine that that was like a field of study. I thought, like, <laughs> this is just a hobby that you do. Um, and so the the striking thing was when I got to college to, you know, as an undergrad at at Cornell to discover there was actually an academic field of computer science with, you know, some rather inspirational faculty who were, who were teaching courses in it. So I ended up double majoring in math and com com in computer science. And, um, you know, I think my interest in computer science uh, were sort of toward the theoretical end of things, you know, given my interest in math. Um, but then, you know, uh, sort of in the mid 90s, kind of 1996, nine, nine, 97, after grad school, um, I, you know, uh, I was doing a postdoc at IBM Almaden with Prabhakar Raghavan, and uh, Prabhakar made the argument that, you know, we're um, this sort of this amazing opportunity that there's the web, which sort of like the personal computer in the early 80s seems like just a glorified hobby that people are just playing around with, but there's a lot going on here. And uh, so I began thinking about, you know, questions about organizing information on the web. And, you know, because with a Ava Tardosh in grad school, um, you know, I had done so much work on graph algorithms, you know, I thought, you know, one thing I contribute here is sort of my, my understanding of graphs. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, thinking about the link structure of the web made me realize that actually, you know, you really need to understand the human system to understand what's going on. And so it was this blend that for me was really a lot of fun that, you know, there was the mathematical aspects of thinking about the network structure, but then it sort of tapped into all, all these other sort of fascinations I, you know, I had from early in high school with, you know, narrative and law and policy and social science and all of that showed up in the web and that's really to understand the web you have to understand all these things and so that's I think somehow how I ended up in this mix of topics that I that I find interesting now. Yeah and so that actually was a really good explanation of the of the what others might see as a Venn diagram with some <laughs> interesting uh, uh, inter intersections. I remember reading um, uh, your your um, your hubs and authority work uh, talking about web stru the structure of the web uh, back in the 90s and thinking about what this might mean for both the science for understanding the the admixture of 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 human interests and human con generated content and human interests in accessing that content um, and the algorithms that we could actually sort of use to to capture and to op to optimize various kinds of of, of objectives yeah um, I'm curious to hear, hear about your reflection about the, you know, um, your, your maybe t describe more about what you were doing with the hubs and authority work and, and what that meant, you think, for the, for the evolution of thinking about the web. I see, yeah. <clears throat> right, so I, um, yeah, I mean, when I first started thinking about the web, it was, fundamentally it seemed like it was an information retrieval problem on a giant text corpus. We had put a lot of documents out there and we want to find the documents that have the terms that we want. Um, but, but when I began thinking about the kinds of queries that I myself was, you know, trying to solve, and and actually at the time, you know, sort of summer of '96, I was moving, you know, for a year to this new place, San Jose. I'd never lived in California, and so you know, you're doing a lot of research about like, you know, where can I buy this thing for my apartment, and so you, you'd be constantly <laughs> on the web, and and sort of like it wasn't, you know, it was often the activity was to try to sort of organize this giant mass of information and figure out what are the good sources, uh, and so I. I, I began to discover a thing that I myself was doing, you know, as I sort of chased down the link structure and tried to sort of engage in some meta awareness of what, what am I doing as I try to buy furniture for my apartment or try to find, you know, you know, what are the reading groups that are meeting about different things. Um, and it, it was clear that the information about which were the important pages was not intrinsic to the page. It wasn't that the, when you found the right page, it wasn't that it said the word you wanted more often or in bigger font or anything. It was really, you only knew that it was the right answer because of all the other things that pointed to it. You know, and I, th I think that, that was the argument that, uh, you know, links were somehow providing this crucial evidence. But the other thing that was happening was that there really was this two-sided nature to it because 
you know, there were these, these good pages. But once you had found a few pages, you realized that there were these other pages that had linked to all of them. And you had sort of missed them on your first pass. But in retrospect, there was this one page that had you just listened to it. It actually had listed, you know, the three things that you end up finding interesting. And it wasn't just that. It had actually listed six things. So now that I'm taking that page more seriously, I should try to figure out what those other three were. You know, it had the top three. Maybe these other three are great also. Um, and so these were these really powerful hub pages. Somebody had done the work before you, and you're to, following. To create the a hub. Yeah, to create a hub. It was someone who had been faced roughly with the same task that you had and had done a very good job solving it and documented their solution. So let's go back and learn from them. And so once we find the good hub, certain things now seem like better authorities. Um, and... You know, and so you think, okay, okay, so they're good authorities, they're good hubs linked to authorities. You know, and then at that point, I think as a computer scientist, you think we should iterate this. You know, I mean, if we found, if we have better estimates for our authorities, we should find better estimates for our hubs. Uh, and the appealing thing is that this iteration had some very natural structure, and it, it sort of exposed this kind of two-sided nature to all, all of these topics, that there were, there was the thing itself, and then there were the pages that all linked to the thing itself, and in some ways served as the glue that held it all together. Kind of this idea of like the, there's there's some human effort to organize that's represented implicitly in lots of activity on the web, and then there's the stuff that's being pointed at as the kind of the, as the as the gold mine, the little gold nuggets of information that someone else has put there just because it's the information itself. Exactly, yeah, and you know, in a, in a way, it's like you know, we can all be basketball fans, for example, and we can all and we're we're all unified by the fact that we all refer to the same basketball stars, even if we never directly interact with the basketball stars, their existence somehow serves to create a community among us. Right, right. And, and, and it seems that those ideas were, were so nascent in, you know, in, the, in the mid to late 90s, coming in part you know, to all the contributions you were making, um, in advance of like page rank and other kinds of structural analyses that, that people now at least say are, are, are core. You don't know what's going on in these algorithms anymore. Right, yeah. but it, are sort of at the, at the root of how we look at the web and how we look at information retrieval and indexing, which is interesting. Now, okay. now, now lately, oh, you had a comment nope, there? Yeah. Comment. I'll say that you, uh, the, the recent work you're doing, I think uh, most recently in some ways, oh, maybe last maybe a couple of years, of course you do many things. Uh, but um, I've been very fa fascinated to see you bringing together policy, law, social science in issues around fairness, which have come to the fore lately when th in people, uh, with people rightly concerned about systematic biases and tools that might amplify them through great use. Um, yeah. And uh, you want to talk a little, a little about some of the work you've done? I think this includes criminal justice, for example. Yeah, uh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so this uh, is something that um, I started thinking about sort of around 2011, 2012. And actually, um, it began with a series of conversations with um, Sentil Mullenothan, who's a, a behavioral economist at Harvard. Right. And uh, Sentil and I had been undergrads together at, at Cornell. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, we actually have a, um, my second paper and his first paper was actually a Podsy 1993 paper that came out of a, a joint uh, class project jointly that we did in Keith Marzullo's operating systems class. <laughs> and then we submitted it. And, uh, yeah, and I, I would never even have collected, connected Keith to both of you at the exactly. same time. Okay. Yeah, well, thanks, for, these... thanks for making that little meta link for me. Exactly, here yeah. No, now it's, it was just a feature of like we both took this really inspiring class from him and just poured a lot of effort into doing a class project for him. But, um, it, you know, and... You know, at the time, it's funny that, you know, Sendel was sort of, you know, Dick Thaler was at Cornell at the time, and Sendel was very excited about these ideas in behavioral economics, but, um, and then, you know, we went our separate ways, uh, and uh, professionally, and uh, starting on 2011, 2012, I mean, it was really Sendel who sort of initiated the contact, and was like, you know, at this point, we're really thinking about very similar things, because, you know, he'd been f very focused on human decision making, and, you know, human experts in high stakes settings, and, or even in low stakes settings, and the kinds of systematic errors that people make. Uh, and I was thinking about algorithms, which are decision-making entities. And we're now in these situations where we can really ask, you know, what's the interface between... And it, it did feel like, you know, around 2011, 2012, there was sort of this missing, this missing subject where, you know, we had human-computer interaction, but there was sort of this emerging human-machine learning interaction, right? You know, like how do humans interact with big data resources and the algorithms that make predictions based on them? Well, we shouldn't forget the human-AI interaction. Human-AI interaction more broadly, broadly. yeah, yeah. More, more broadly, absolutely, yeah. But please yeah. go on. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. And I, I think of those as all yeah. bundled together at this point. Um, and so we, we looked at domains where, you know, where the situation called for a prediction. Uh, the, the idea being, there are lots of kind, lots of decisions that human beings make, and it's a fascinating question to ask: which of these can be automated, which ones can't?
Well, let's zero in on, on the cases where what people are doing is making predictions and asking what we can learn about the human process and also whether there are gains to be had. And so uh, we started talking to um, Jens Ludwig, who is a crime policy, actually a public policy researcher at University of Chicago, one of whose domains is crime policy. And he had these very interesting data sets on judges making bail decisions. Um, and the reason to look at bail is that if you look at criminal justice, obviously one of the highest stake settings where experts are, are making decisions that have enormous impact on people's lives. If you look at the pipeline of decisions that get made there, right, there are decisions about arrest, decisions about pretrial detention and bail, you know, decisions at trial, sentencing, parole, many, many things. Um, if you ask where in that pipeline is a person doing something that most resembles a pure prediction task, at least according to the law, that's arguably in bail. Because what the law says a judge should do in bail is to release the person before a trial if they believe that with high probability they will return for their court appearance without committing a crime in the meantime. And they shouldn't be thinking about their eventual guilt or innocence. They shouldn't be thinking about what's the incentive effect of my decision on future defendants. You should be making that prediction. Now, there's a whole important set of questions about are they making you know exactly that, that, that prediction. But this is at least a case where we could come in with the data that we have and, and try analyzing that. So this was an appealing problem. I, uh, I roped in Yuri Leskovic, my former postdoc, and his student, Hima Lakaraju, um, who's graduating right now. And, uh, Yuri's a former uh, intern here at Microsoft Research, yes, yeah. so uh, we really appreciated uh, sharing his intellect. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, no, I mean, he's been uh, an enormous pleasure to work with over now, more than yeah, a decade. And, absolutely. Um, and, uh, and so the five of us set off on this, on this project, which actually took a number of years. I mean, we really started this in summer. It's really got going with the five of us in summer of 2013. And, um, and so there were a lot of challenges here that, um, you know, so a, a, as you said, you know, one challenge is that the data is biased, right? So if we think about this as a prediction problem, there are features and there's a label. So the features are maybe the administrative data that we have on past arrests, uh, for what types of crimes, past convictions, what was the status of the person at the time of the arrest, um, you know, information that the algorithm is able to see in some kind of tabular form. Um, and then the label is, if they got released, did they return for their court appearance without, without committing a crime? Um, on the feature side, of course, you know, the administrative data is contaminated by the incredibly differential rates of policing in, in different areas. And so, you know, an arrest does not necessarily mean the same thing uh, in all different areas. And per unit level of crime, it doesn't mean the same things. And that, that, that becomes a big issue. And it, it, it's, it's very much in the spirit of what people worry about when we say we're, we're, we're taking, you know, biases that already came in, you know, already predated this moment in the courtroom. On, on the label, this notion of predicting crime while they're released, we don't really have a label out crime, we have a label out arrest. All we can really do is see if they were arrested. Um, uh, even failure to appear has a, a lot of correlation with, with socioeconomic status. And so there are I issues both on the kind of input and, and on the output. Um, then there are the methodological challenges. And the, the biggest one that we faced was the fact that if the judge releases someone, we can see what happened. If the judge detains someone before a trial, we don't know what would have happened yes, in the event. Kind of a, you have to make it some sort of counterfactual argument. Exactly, yeah. you have to make a counterfactual argument. And, and, the, and the more we thought about that, the more we realized this is a feature of many domains, right? You know, so I mean like in the sort of decision making in the medical domain, which you're very familiar with, you know, if the doctor you know, applies a treatment or doesn't apply a treatment, we're now in two different worlds and we only get certain labels about things, you know. Um, if I choose, you know, if I have a, if I choose to hire someone, I see how they would have done at my company. If I choose not to hire them, they may go somewhere else, but I'm not going to know how they would have done in the environment of my company. So often we get these, this one-sided label, and it's not just randomly one-sided, it's based on the decision that the decision maker themselves made. Uh, and so the question was, how do we demonstrate some kind of, you know, a gain or not through algorithms if we only have labels in that kind of situation? Um, and so at the, at the core of what we were doing was to exploit some natural v variation where we could actually, and, and so the kind of, you know, the sort of few sentence version of the trick that's, that's at the heart of the paper is that in many sayings you have defendants sort of as if randomly assigned, quasi-randomly assigned to uh, multiple judges who differ in their rates of leniency. So I have a judge who releases 80 out of every 100 people, I have a judge who releases 90 out of every 100 people. So now I have a new way to release 80 out of 100 people, which is I could send them to the judge who releases 90 out of 100, sort them all by risk as computed by the algorithm, and then use the algorithm to detain 10, the 10 people it finds the riskiest in that set of 90. So the judge releases 90, we contract it back to 80, and now we have 
a set of 80 defendants who we've detained. So now we have two ways to detain 80 defendants. We send them to the judge who is 80% lenient, or we do this hybrid human algorithmic rule where the human sort of overshoots and the algorithm scales it back. Uh, and that's now an apples to apples comparison in some sense. And, mm -hmm. yeah, and right. there we could demonstrate actually that there's a lower crime rate on the hybrid human algorithmic rule, right? That somehow the worst decisions that the judge is making are pretty bad. And if you could simply fix those, you could leave most of the judge's decisions completely intact and just basically improve at the margins. And this was sort of intriguing to us because it, it was an interesting alternative to the dichotomy between should we have humans do the work, should we fully automate, right? That's not really a binary decision. It's really that there are cases where the algorithm can be improving things at the margin. You, you can say, I'm going to come in and fix the worst decisions, right? It's almost uh, somewhere in one of our drafts of the paper, we make this analogy to, you know, it's you know, in the realm of cars, it's, you know, we think about human drivers or self-driving cars. But of course, long before we ever got near self-driving cars, we had all sorts of algorithmic assistance, computer assistance in the vehicle that's sort of preventing you from making the worst mistakes well, in your driving. These, these emergency braking systems. Exactly, yeah, emergency braking, now, yeah. parking assists. It's interesting, you just, just yesterday, I'm not sure when this video will be watched, but just yesterday we had a, a report of an Uber uh, um, self-driving car with a with human oversight uh, killing a, a pedestrian, right. uh, unfortunately, and uh, it's um, kind of a landmark in this kind of thing. It's kind of a kind of situation we, we we'd been worried about with with automation being applied in, in the world, and in some discussions, well, people have said, "Oh, you know, the cars will likely save many." lives, I think it was like over 36,000 last year, deaths and over a million injuries in the United States alone. And uh, over a million worldwide, we hear of deaths uh, from automobile accidents. And certainly these cars will, even when they're, they have these rough edges, will be saving lives. Um, but there's also the sense that when it's an automated system, there's a high standard we have for how it behaves and the values yeah. it represents. Um, Thoughts on, on, on where we're going with, uh, with these, this kinds of auto automation in any safety yeah. critical areas? Yeah, it's a interesting. So I, this is a, a fascinating debate, I think. You know, should we hold algorithms to a higher standard? And on the one hand, you know, there's something appealing about saying that we should hold algorithms to a higher standard. Um, on the other hand, you're giving up something really tangible. I mean, there are a lot of lives that would potentially be saved if you decided not to hold algorithms to quite so high a standard. And so you're... You're, you're paying for this decision at a high cost. And I think that's what makes this, uh, what makes this so tricky. I, I do think it's interesting. I, I mean, I've, I've been sort of trying to understand some about the issue of, you know, why, you know, I think, you know, I do, and I think everyone I talk to, you know, feels this, you know, this particularly strong reaction to, you know, the algorithm, you know, the algorithm caused harm, the algorithm did something. And, you know, I think, um, you know, if we take, uh, you know, if we take some of the sort of pedagogical examples where we see algorithms causing harm, where the algorithm is in a no-win situation, has to swerve left or right, and it's going to going to kill someone uh, or hurt someone. And in those kind of situations, which are sort of awful to contemplate, humans in those situations where it's an awful situation, uh, it's very hard to say why they did what they did. Something happened very fast. They tried their best. They made an essentially random decision. Something terrible happened. It was an accident, as we call it, right? Um, one problem with, with the algorithm is, of course, we can go in and we can find millisecond by millisecond what it was doing, why did it decide to turn left and not right, what was it actually thinking right. about. And I feel like, you know, if we, if we step back, since we always tend to anthropomorphize these things, you know, we attach more moral opprobrium to things that are premeditated, to things where you thought it through and you did the bad thing anyway. And, and the problem is everything the algorithm does, most things the algorithm does, are premeditated because we can see what it was thinking. Whereas with the human at some level, we'll never know what they're thinking. They were trying their best to avoid a homeless Under situation. very, very bounded resources. Exactly. They had to do it all in real time. Yeah, whereas... <laughs> so their best intuitions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And somehow the algorithm was somehow engaging in calculation about things where we think it's morally questionable to engage in calculation. And, and that, I think, is maybe part of the reason why we ascribe. But that... You you know, might, we might say it also certainly brings to the, to the, to the, to the, into salience the fact that at those moments for decision making, you see... Uh, uncertainty represented potentially and an action that was taken and an objective function that's clear and you can state it now and it sits yeah. in a machine somewhere. Yeah. Someone said, here's the trade you make in this situation, here's the cost and benefit. Yeah. And so that brings that that's that that explicitness I think also brings up questions where the question should have been to begin with, even with implicit decision making. It, <laughs> that's the question. And of course you've 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 thought a lot about these issues, but 
you know, I do feel like a lot of people, you know, uh, you know, genuinely feel like, e even having thought about it, that there's some advantage to living in a world of strategic ambiguity, <laughs> where we right. we never actually yeah. calculate, you know, the choice between two two terrible alternatives. So, so um, you've done many different pieces of work. Um, a lot of them, again, as you said, at these interesting intersections, um, looking at communities, for example, how communities form on the web and, and their nature and structure, uh, how links get formed, and the power of link prediction and so on, and, and some of the we see daily and now in our in our in our various services like Facebook yeah. and LinkedIn. Some comments on on the directions there and and why that's so exciting. Um, yeah, I, I mean, if I sort of look over the, you know, the sort of longer history of this, I, I feel like, you know, so if I uh, back up to where we were talking about web search circa 1996, 97, you know, I, I think at the time, you know, the conceptualization I had was really the web is this kind of vast universal library of all human knowledge, and you go and you dip into the library and you pull out knowledge from it. Um, I feel like there was a a period 2004 2006 was sort of a really important period in the development of of the web it was really a moment when you know the somehow the level of participation the technology the bandwidth had reached a point where people could actually step out behind their web pages and interact more directly it was no longer i interact with you because my web page linked to your web page it's that we're directly commenting on each other's content tagging each other's content collaboratively authoring something you know and so it was really it's in that kind of, it's kind of an interactive phase transition maybe yeah or, that, or experiential phase transition exactly yeah and you know and a lot of the things that we now take as sort of the pillars of the current web all came out right that right so in in that you know 2 to 3 year period you know you see the creation of facebook uh, youtube twitter right all of them sort of you know all of this social media sort of you know kind of speciating sort of really quickly in that period. It's funny you mentioned this time I remember being interviewed by somebody uh, on the work that we, we did, um, which is of your interest, Ali, as well, on and with, with Yuri Leskovic on degrees of separation. Yeah. And it created a kind of a flurry, and I remember trying to explain to um, uh, a, a well-known um, uh, moderator on, uh, I think it was on um, CNBC, what Facebook was, yeah. you know, what social media was. And I yeah. remember having to you know, come up with like, let me explain this in yeah. 20 words or less, but it had to be explained. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> things move so fast that things that you could present as novelties three or four years later feel like common knowledge. And it's, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, you know, I, you know, I, I remember the first Google faculty summit they brought us all there and we're like, <laughs> we have this amazing new thing called Gmail. It offers a megabyte, you know, a, a gigabyte <laughs> of storage. And, you know, and on the horizon is this amazing new prototype called Google Maps, you know. And it's, and it's like that was only, what, you know, 12, 13 years ago. Isn't and, interesting uh, it, how, how fast that, that, that has happened. Yeah. It, but back to this idea of yeah. the community and the interaction. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think that period, suddenly people were interacting directly. And, uh, and that, certainly I, that struck me as a very, you know, important, moment. And, you know, even to the extent I've been thinking about the web graph for sort of 10 years up to that point, you know, this idea of human social networks now being really reflected online, uh, you know, I, I think it's been a very, you know, a very powerful thing. And, you know, it, it certainly brought about a new kind of information seeking behavior, a new way in which we engage with things where, you know, rather than just go out and look for things, it, it comes to you through your network of friends, as it did in the offline world. And, you know, and obviously, you know, it's sort of, Anytime one talks about that now, you know, one has to think about sort of the ways in which this has evolved in, in, the, in the past few years, where you now have this combination of your real friends from the offline world sharing information with you, and then commercial entities sharing information with you, and all of that's somehow happening in a big super, super position. This is what you're being exposed to now online. Now, now I want to come back to that topic in a second, but I first want to route you through thinking about some of your contributions uh, with your collaborators on incentives and web activity. Um, you did some really fabulous work on uh, badges, for example, and I'm trying to understand um, how different kinds of, of um, programs for reinforcing work, for example, say in a crowdsourcing system um, or a system where people are helping each other, um, GitHub, for example, um, how you can actually shape um, what people do based on the design of the merit program. Yeah. Can I say a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. So this was uh, something that, that, that we, we became interested in because in the, 
in the online world, there became this proliferation of badges. If you do this much of the activity, then you get a badge. If you do this much, this frequently over some period of time, you get a badge. And these clearly had uh, incentivizing effects. People, people would set these as goals for themselves. And um, you know, in some work that uh, Yuri Leskovic, Ashton Anderson, and Dan Huntlocker and I did, you know, you, you actually see the effect where as people neared a milestone, their activity increased, and then they <laughs> hit the milestone and it dropped off. Like they were clearly aiming for that as the finish line. And so you, you end up with this interesting sort of badge design problem, sort of badge placement problem, where it's almost as though you had people sort of steering through the space of activities. And in a way, we actually first discovered it this way, that we were looking at just the activity as though it was just organic activity. And we saw everyone was kind of torquing in this strange direction in this part of the space. And, you know, we almost felt like sort of astrophysicists saying, there's clearly <laughs> some gravitating body here that's bending that's the flow. Right, that's right. We have to figure out what it is because it's invisible to us. It's some kind it's of dark matter. It's sort of dark matter exactly. structure. Exactly. And, yeah. and, and yeah. you go and you're like, oh, look, there's a badge right there, right? And everyone's bending around it as they try to get yeah, the badge. Yeah. And if you take your telescope up, you exactly. see this badge coming into view with the scope. Exactly. I know. It's like, and, um, you know, and, and then you, you, you actually, like, you know, plot the flow lines and, and you would see this. And so that becomes. I always, a, a always thought about when I, when I saw that, those figures. In your paper, <laughs> magnetic filings. Yeah, like exactly right. Up. It's like yeah. iron filings <laughs> line up with the. Yeah. yeah, and and so what's nice is you can build some models in which you know it's actually in retrospect an intuitive model that if a badge is very far away, yeah. there's a good chance I'm going to leave the system before it ever becomes relevant to me. If I'm very close to a badge, I'm probably going to make it, and so it actually acquires more value, and so it actually has more drawing power the closer I get to it, almost like a sort of you know one of these physical objects, um, and so it, it becomes a a design problem, like where should I put the badges, right? So now it's up to me, you know, uh, I'm trying to sort of create some beautiful shape with the iron filings. I could put the magnets, the little bar magnets, wherever I want. Um, and it, it, it does have an effect, right? If I create an incentive that comes too soon, I get everyone to participate, but pretty quickly they're through the incentive and I've lost control over them. If I put it too far away, it seems hopeless. And there is some kind of optimal distance at which to put the incentive so it kind of pulls people toward it. Uh, in a way that's achievable. Uh, and yeah. so that's, uh, yeah, so I, I think there's a very interesting design space there. Where you so, let, so now I want to come back to an earlier topic. I thought <laughs> I was going to go to, to the incentives first. And this is the idea uh, of mixing these ideas of incentives and design. Um, often we say with uh, well-intentioned designers who have the users in mind or learnings or the community in mind when they do a design like this, to other incentive, uh, other incentives and objectives, to the point where we see um, the possibility in this new connected world with all sorts of entities, including commercial entities, to do large scale um, uh, designs aimed at manipulation, which might not necessarily be in line with the interests of the individuals, and uh, um, the the prospect, for example. Uh, and the possibility that some of the best machine learning people coming out of our departments uh, and our organizations now will go off and spend time with large-scale data sets and machine learning algorithms to optimize time of engagement on a timeline, the duration, for example, or the uh, other kinds of behaviors on the web that might be uh, aimed at, at commerce, at, at maximizing profits, and therefore, therefore uh, being you know, sort of there, there being great incentives by entities to create algorithmic approaches to doing adversarial, in some ways, attacks on human attention. Um, what do you think, where is this going, and how might we, we, we address this potential problem? Yeah, so this is obviously an interesting question. And here, the, I, I think the challenge is this, this, this problem is so hard that, you know, I sort of hesitate to say anything that sounds prescriptive because I really don't think I've thought hard about it enough to really, and I've, thought pretty hard about it, but I, I just feel like it's an incredibly hard thing. I should say it's, you know, it is not a completely new issue. So um, as a child, I watched a lot of beer commercials because I liked watching football and baseball. And because I liked football and baseball and I was age eight, I also saw lots of beer commercials. And you, and you, <laughs> uh -huh. you can ask whether that was, you know, the socially optimal allocation of people's attention, but it was very much the, the, the state of the world. It too was some sort of an adversarial attack on, right? So you know, most of professional sports was underwritten by ultimately advertising. And so if you liked professional sports, or if you liked any kind of entertainment, you, you were going to see a lot of advertising. And often advertising that wasn't particularly well targeted to your particular interests. And, you know, and, and I think that was some of the, you know, the optimism around online media that, 
you know, the things that are going to be generating revenue ought to at least be tailored to things that are appropriate for you. And in the end, isn't that actually a better kind of advertising? You know, when, um, so I think, you know, we've always created media that tries to optimize for engagement, tries to optimize for attention. We've tended to do it with more qualitative tools. We haven't had the kind of quantitative. Like, for example, when we were going up even now, you know, an episode of The Twilight Zone would, be, would just hit that moment and someone would say, be, we'll be right back. Don't yeah. don't go away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And all of these were, you know, sort of, you know, lower data attempts to to get something. So, I don't think that in terms of the intent, something new is happening that wasn't happening then. I think, as you're saying, what what has changed is that there, you know, there's much more data and therefore much much more ability to do really sort of you know um, surgically precise. In, in interventions, but uh, I think it's 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 it's, it's an activity that has sort of been true for you know as long as sort of humans have created media to attract the attentions of other uh, other uh, other human beings. Um, but that you know at some point quantity becomes quality, and so uh, I think it does does bring does bring definitely uh, new issues into play. And you know, and the the extent the extent to which we should ask you know to what extent is you know people's immediate interest in seeking out what kind of activates or energizes them, you know, to what extent should we trade that off with long-term gain, right? And I think, you know, that's that's not just a societal interest, even for the platforms themselves. Yeah. In the end, platforms are perhaps less worried about whether you spend the next one hour on the platform and more whether you remain an engaged participant o over the long term. And so if you're doing something in the short term that keeps people, you know, emotionally aroused and on the platform, but in the long run they feel bad about the experience, um, that's neither in society's interest nor is it in the platform's yeah, interest. I, I guess you could imagine the concern being that you do both. You, you arouse them and <laughs> you get them interested in the long term. And, and five years from now, someone looks back and says, boy, I wish I spent my time in a better way. And so there is this idea of, you know, of some movement of re or some reflection at the level of industry or society more generally civil liberties organizations yeah. at time well spent and what does that mean and yeah. when does that run counter to commercial goals with uh, their precision manipulation slash yeah. attack slash optimization of how uh, they they would like to have people spend their attention and yeah. time yeah no I, I think it's it's yeah this is a very important issue which I've you know, sort of. I've been thinking about it more and more just because it's it's clearly on everyone's well, on everyone's minds. But it. Yeah. But I, uh, you know, I. It is useful to think back to everything that was said about TV and like my generation was supposedly ruined by all the TV <laughs> that we watched. You know, all the kind of mindless entertainment, the violent entertainment, yes. all the commercials we were exposed to. This was why our country was falling behind all the other countries. It, all of this. I mean, I got an enormous diet of this kind of worry and anxiety yeah. in the yeah. 1980s, and it was. It was, you know, because there was a media industry that was motivated by similar things. They needed to keep an audience that was engaged. So, I do think, you know, as we, as we think about this, it's, it's, I think it's useful to separate the parts that are new, which is how data assisted and computation assisted is, from the parts that are old, which is the kind of urge of, you know, people providing media and providing content to keep their audiences engaged, you know, uh, in ways that worry some of us. Yeah. So, changing topics to um, m maybe. Uh, um, Friendlier ones and so on, <laughs> less serious, but but still important in, yeah. in terms of time well spent. When I visited you uh, and gave a, a talk, I remember in 1999 at Cornell, yes. I, gave, I gave a keynote and you hosted me. Uh, and uh, I, I remember um, uh, when you were dropping me at the airport or back at the hotel, wherever I, where I was going, you had your big uh, bags full of hockey equipment, you and your wife. Yeah. Uh, and you're going to have to play ice hockey. Do you still play hockey? Uh, I've played it less and less over time. Yeah, so I, at the time, we, we played twice a week, and I, I remember talking about it with you. And we actually should have had you play um, when you were there. I, we, uh, I think we learned from our mistake because a couple of years later, we invited John Lafferty. Uh, who was uh, a, oh, I hear he's a good player. Incredibly yeah. good player. Yeah. And, and, uh, we didn't know that at the time, but he said, oh, he plays hockey. And we're like, perfect. After, so we gave the colloquium, we went to a quick dinner, didn't eat too much, and then we brought him to the hockey and everything. And, you know, and he had to borrow skates that didn't quite fit, and he had a helmet that didn't quite fit. And we're like, oh, that's <laughs> not right. a good thing. Case, case, that's terrible. Case, I know, case, exactly. Case, yeah. And 
despite that, the instant he stepped on the ice, we're like, oh wait, he's really good. Because, you know, you, you can tell within, you know, a few seconds that someone's really good at this. And uh, yeah, so we've, we definitely, and so that was the whole phase when we, we yeah, we were both playing. Well, we, just so you know, I'm due out to give a talk soon at Cornell, so I'm going to take you up on this potentially. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, sh I, sh I, sh I should add the sad code to this that uh, over time we've definitely been playing. You know, and that's sort of, here. yeah, you know, and, you know, obviously sort of, you know, becoming parents adds, you know, new time constraints and getting busier. And, th and then I reached a point where I also fear injury, you know. I mean, like, you know, I would say in our annual intramural league, somebody would get non-trivially injured at least once during the, you know, and, you know, I'm definitely keenly aware that I don't recover from things as fast as I want to. Yeah, you know, so. I, 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 I play ice hockey also, and, and typically uh, it's, we have on a once-a-week team, <laughs> Uh, and I have to say that you watch these like like popcorn, uh, you know, it's like a poisson process. Yeah, you know, exactly. These injuries will occur, and once in a while, you like, you know you walk out with an injury, and yeah. it takes a while to, to recover. And as you say, as you get a little older, things take a little bit longer to to, to reset. <laughs> yeah. To say, uh, and then a few comments about um, you talked a little bit about your background, um, you know, um, having fun with the with with the Apple uh, two, and, yeah. and then. Um, Finding out this is actually a field and having a place to leverage your math and your inclination to see math actually execute in the real world yeah, and yeah. have influence and, and help us to interpret the real world. Um, what kind of advice would you give to, to let's say, undergraduates now, um, maybe finishing up their undergrad careers and how to think about next steps? Yeah, that's a great question. And I mean, Certainly, I think all of us have been, you know, thrilled at the level of interest in computer science. It's just been, been growing rapidly, and it, it's enormous over the over the past few years. You know, I mean, I, th I think one is to really um, just think about how broadly the ideas of computing can be applied. I mean, I, I think al almost every area either is being, you know, influenced by the ideas of computation or could be. And so, I think, you know, it's it's a great opportunity to really take this as a fundamental body of knowledge that you can combine with almost anything else that you find interesting. You know, I mean, it. as I said, you know, in eighth grade, I wanted to be a lawyer when I grew up, and it took me a very long time to finally come back and sort of combine the computation with that interest, but in the end, there's just, you know, and I was sort of late to the party. People have been doing it all, all, all along, but um, it, uh, I think, you know, if you have an interest, it's almost sure to be compatible with ideas from computing in some way, and that's just, just how broad the field has become. And th then I think the other thing that, you know, I try to advise, uh, advise students is like, it's easy to see in the media how we live in an era of big science and all science is gonna be done by giant teams, and your future is to be the person who contributes one tiny data point on some giant plot, you know. And I think, um, I can't speak for the other sciences and what that looks like, but in computer science, I think what's so exciting is that there are still exciting discoveries to be made, you know, you and a manageable data set and your laptop and some new conceptual idea. And, uh, you know, a lot of stuff happens still, you know, in groups of, you know, two or three or one uh, with very modest resources. And there are still amazing things to be discovered there. Um, <clears throat> you know, obviously, there's also the stuff that happens on big data centers, you know, and so, some of it needs that. Uh, and if if that's what you're interested in, there's there's room to work in that style. But it's sort of nice to know that, you know, someone working just with a friend of theirs on a laptop can still do things that, you know, attract everyone's, attract everyone's attention. And that's, a, that's also a very appealing thing about the field that, you know, the important problems are still accessible and some of them are quite, quite manageable for people, you know, who are undergrads or just going to college. Well, that's a great place to stop. Well, thanks very much. Yeah, Enjoy talking thanks to a you. lot. Good talking to you.